Hello students, today we will be talking about the structure, composition and nutritive value of cereals, millets and pulses. Cereals belong to the family of Graminaceae and the seed is called as grain or caryopsis. It is the staple diet of many uh, people around the globe and this is very important as a source of energy or carbohydrate in the diet of all these people. Now, different type of cereals are grown in different climatic conditions. Uh, for example, rice is grown in the subtropical and tropical areas of the world like Asia etc. Whereas, wheat is grown in the temperate regions of the world and oats and rye etc are grown in the northern and the eastern European region. Now, coming to the structure of the cereal grain, broadly it is the same for almost all the cereals and it is basically divided into two components. Major component is endosperm which is about 80 percent of the cereal grain and the next part is the germ. Now, both the endosperm and the germ are to a 90 percent extent covered by a layer which is called as bran layer and this is composed of three sub layers. The first layer is pericarp, underneath that is testa and below that is the aileron layer. Now, these three layers put together are called as bran and this bran uh, is rich in fiber, B complex vitamins and lipids. Now, below that is the major component endosperm which comprises mostly of the starch of the cereal grain, some amount of proteins and also some B vitamins. Now, just at the corner of the endosperm is the germ, but it is a very very important layer because this germ gives rise to the new shoot or the plant and this as a result the germ contains lot of amino acids as a part of the protein as well as lipids, B vitamins and certain minerals. Now, this germ is attached to the endosperm with the help of scutellum which mobilizes all the nutrients during the process of germination. So, here we complete the structure of the cereal grain. Okay, students, now we go on to module 2 which covers the composition and the nutritive value of cereals. Now, cereals are made up of 12 to 14 percent moisture, uh, 65 to 75 percent uh, starch and 6 to 12 percent of protein and 1 to 6 percent of lipids. Mostly the gross composition of all the cereals is similar. Now, coming to the specifics energy and carbohydrates. Now, cereals are mainly made up of 80 percent of carbohydrate and this carbohydrate is divided into two components. One is the crude fiber and soluble carbohydrate. Now, the soluble carbohydrate component is mostly made up of starch. So, apart from the soluble carbohydrate as well as the crude fiber content, there are certain amounts of free sugars and also dextrins which are found in cereals. Now, the starch component of the cereal grain uh, is mostly concentrated in the uh, endosperm and very little amount in the form of sugars are found in the germ layer. The whole grain cereals are good sources of fiber and amongst all the cereals the wheat, sorghum, oats and rye are very good sources of fiber. Now, we go to proteins. The amount of proteins which are found in cereals is about uh, 6 to 12 percent and the amount of protein varies from cereal to cereal grain. Uh, for example, in rice we find 
protein to an extent of 6 percent whereas in wheat the protein is uh, found to be to an extent of 12 percent. Now the protein content of cereals varies within the cereal grain components also. For example, more protein is found in the bran, the aileron and the germ layers and also the scutellum when compared with the endosperm and the testa. Now within the endosperm also as the protein content or the concentration of protein increases from center towards the periphery. The type of proteins which are found in cereals include albumins, globulins, prolamines and glutelins and glutelins and prolamines are called as gluten proteins. Now in wheat for example the prolamines and the glutelins are found majority and therefore they are also called as gluten proteins because these two proteins when needed in the presence of water they contribute a very good elasticity or elastic property to the dough. Now coming to the quality of proteins in cereals is measured in terms of uh, two components one the digestibility of the protein and the biological value. Now the biological value of the proteins found in cereals is low mostly because of the absence of the essential amino acid lysine. Now this as a result there is a lowering of the quality. Now when the same cereals are consumed along with pulses. Now pulses are deficient in methionine and tryptophan whereas cereals are deficient in lysine. So when they are eaten together now the lysine content of pulses is high and the methionine content of cereals is high. Therefore when they are both eaten together in a vegetarian diet both of them supplement each other and the persons will be receiving a good quality protein. Therefore a cereal based diet supplemented with pulses contributes to good amount of proteins in the diet of the people every day. Lipids are found to a very small extent of 1 to 6 percent in the various cereal grains for example 1 percent in rice 2 percent in wheat and the bigger concentration is found that is 3 percent in maize. Now the lipids are mostly the triglycerides of oleic, palmitic and uh, linoleic acids and they contribute 50 percent to the requirement of the essential fatty acids in our body every day. Most of the minerals are in the form of sulfates and phosphates of calcium, magnesium and potassium and 80 percent of the phosphorus is found in the form of phytin. Now the importance of phytin is it uh, interferes with the bioavailability of iron in our daily diet and uh, this can be eliminated through processing techniques and it can be eliminated by polishing as well as refining and germination and fermentation. Now the other minerals cereals contain very small quantities of cobalt, manganese and iron and uh, wheat, wheat increases in its iron content when iron rollers are used in the mills for processing wheat. Now ragi is a very good source of calcium and also the millet bajra is an excellent source of iron and the extent of iron and calcium in these two millets uh, depends upon the extent of polishing. All the cereal grains contain various quantities and various types of cere uh, enzymes but what is important are certain enzymes such as amylases, proteases, lipases and oxidoreductases 
and these enzyme uh, help in the digestion and the absorption of these cereals when they act upon them. Now the alpha amylase activity in the cereals increases when the grain is malted or as we uh, use another term called as germination. So this helps the alpha amylase increase in the cereals helps in cleaving the complex uh, structure of starch and making the food less starchy or thick. Now the various antinutrients are a couple of them for example the enzyme inhibitors, the tannins or the polyphenolic compounds. Now these are found mostly in uh, and also the phytates as I spoke to you earlier. Now phytates are mostly found in cereals in the form of phytin which interfere with the bioavailability of minerals and also proteins. Whereas polyphenolic compounds and tannins and also the other antinutritional factors like enzyme inhibitors they are mostly found in millets and they also interfere with the digestion and absorption of carbohydrates as well as proteins. We continue with model 3 under cereals and millets and this module 3 I am going to concentrate only on millets. Now millets are called as poor man's cereal and they are also very rich sources of energy and they are mostly grown in the arid and semi-arid parts of the world. Now these are more popular in the eastern nations than in the west and they include several millets like for example foxtail millet, the proso millet, the finger millet as well as sorghum. Now mostly as I said these are grown in countries like India, China, Sri Lanka and other Asian countries like Malaysia etc. But in India we mostly consume three types of uh, millets which are more popular and there are others also lesser known millets we call them. Now we consume first and foremost the finger millet which is ragi. Now this ragi is grown and eaten very popularly in uh, states of India such as Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and uh, Tamil Nadu also and it is eaten in various ways. This ragi provides high amount of uh, energy because it also contains starch. It is a good source of protein. It is rich in uh, B complex vitamins and one important uh, component which it contributes to the diet when compared to the cereals is the calcium, the mineral calcium. But at the same time ragi is also high in fiber content and it also contains certain phytates or phytin which uh, interfere uh, as the uh, with the bioavailability of uh, minerals. Now ragi is eaten across India wherever it is being eaten in a most unpolished uh, or unrefined directly ground into flour and various products are made out of ragi and in short ragi is a highly nutritious food and recently again in the last decade it has gained popularity because of its uh, high fiber content which helps in the improving the functionality of the probiotics and it is also being popularized by the dietitians and nutritionists to be included in the diet of diabetic patients. Now the second uh, millet which is popularly consumed across India is what we call sorghum and or jowar. Now this jowar is available in the varieties of white, yellow or red color or the brown color jowar and this is also ground totally ground into flour and made into uh, chapatis or bhakris as they call 
and it is uh, very popularly consumed in the uh, east uh, western states of india like uh, gujarat maharashtra etc and many other uh, ways also jowar is used and it is highly nutritious and the only thing is digestibility of these uh, millets is less now this bajra is one of the most important uh, millet grown in india it is rich in fiber it provides energy and protein and also it contains or it supplies our diet with iron and uh, this uh, bajra is mostly eaten in gujarat maharashtra etc in the form of what they call bhakri now the protein digestibility of the cereals like rice wheat maize etc happens to be around 95 to 100% whereas the protein digestibility of millets is comparatively less between around 77 to 80% and this is because of the presence of what we call the polyphenolic compounds and or tannins and the phytates and as these uh, millets are mostly eaten uh, into gr uh, directly ground into flour without any polishing and refining and they are eaten as such so therefore this concludes the module 3 of cereals and millets now we go on to module number 4 and we will be covering legumes and pulses under this now legumes are the edible seeds of the plants belonging to the a genus leguminaceae and the seeds are mostly grown for an important source of protein uh, across the world especially in the vegetarian diets now except soya beans which have a high protein content of about 40% most of the legumes provide around universally similar 22 to 24% of proteins the uh, legumes contribute very important uh, proteins in the diet of people across the world when compared with animal protein uh, they cost is much less now the legumes which uh, are popular in the countries include uh, countries like asian countries mexico argentina south american countries as well as in the middle east whereas in uh, western countries the consumption of uh, peas beans or what we call legume consumption is very low compared to the asian and other middle eastern countries they are very important uh, contributors of protein and they also provide uh, carbohydrates and total energy coming from uh, legumes and peas beans etc is uh, similar to that of cereals which is around 340 kilo calories per 100 grams now apart from uh, as a source of food these legumes also help us to uh, when they are grown in a field help us to fix the atmospheric nitrogen enriching the um, uh, value of the soil in which they are grown it is very difficult to imagine our diets in india mostly without pulses as a source of proteins proteins uh, are present to an extent of 22 to 24% in pulses except in soya beans as i said earlier they are found to an extent of about 40% of protein in soya beans now the proteins of <coughs> the pulses uh, they even though they are high in amount there is a lack of sulfur containing amino acids methionine and tryptophan in pulses therefore the quality of the protein pulses is slightly lower but in a diet uh, in the country like india when they are eaten in combination with cereals either uh, rice or wheat cereal proteins are lacking in the amino acid lysine whereas the pulse protein is lacking in the amino acid methionine and tryptophan but the same methionine and tryptophan are found in high or uh, good amounts in cereals 
and lysine is found in high amounts in pulses. So, when they are eaten in combi uh, combination they supplement each other's protein value and we get a complete protein in our daily diet. Now, there is a, a lower digestibility in the pulse proteins basically because of three reasons. The first is the molecular weight of the pulse proteins is very high and they are found in very compact molecules. The second reason is the native protein in the pulses is found in a form of complex with the carbohydrate moiety and therefore, it becomes slightly difficult to digest. Now, the third component is because of the high presence of phytin or phytates in these pro, uh, pulses therefore, the which interfere with the digestibility. In the pulses about uh, pulses provide 55 to 60 percent of starch and this uh, starch is in the form of both uh, um, soluble carbohydrate and there is also certain undigestible carbohydrate or fiber which is found. Now, we also find certain amount of sugars in the pulses and most of these sugars belong to the oligosaccharides of the raffinose family. Now, there is a very very important and interesting fact about these uh, oligosaccharides because they mostly are made up of three kinds of uh, sugars which include raffinose, stachyose and verbiscose. Now, these uh, oligosaccharides of the raffinose family they escape digestion in the stomach and instead due to the lack of enzyme alpha galactosidase. Now, they enter the lower part of the intestinal tract without undergoing digestion and therefore, there in that part of the intestinal tract they are acted upon by the microflora present and which results in the production of gas such as carbon dioxide, methane and hydrogen. Therefore, uh, many people they are a little worried about consumption of legumes because of the production of gas due to the presence of the oligosaccharides of the raffinose family. Uh, pulses provide about 1.5 percent lipids and mostly they are of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids and along with cereals the essential fatty acid requirement is completely met when in a vegetarian diet we consume the mostly the cereals and the pulses and the lipids of both these uh, provide our body with essential fatty acid requirement daily. In minerals the pulses contain uh, small quantities or moderate quantities of calcium, iron, cobalt, manganese and also phosphorus, but 80 percent of this phosphorus is found in the form of phytin and therefore, which interferes with the bioavailability of iron. Now, but uh, the iron and calcium content uh, can be improved upon by refining what we call the dehusking of the pulses, but beans are very good sources of iron in the diet of people, uh, dried beans. Pulses provide very good sources of uh, B complex vitamins which include thiamine, niacin, folic acid, pantothenic acid and also very uh, they are lacking basically in the amounts of vitamin A and C, but vitamin A and C is available to some extent when these pulses are eaten fresh and tender and in a, a green condition. Now, enzyme inhibitors. Now, these are proteins in nature and they are found widely distributed in all the pulses and legumes and they interfere basically uh, with the action of enzymes such as uh, trypsin, chymotrypsin and alpha amylase. So, we call them as 
tryptrypsin inhibitor, chymotrypsin inhibitor and alpha amylase inhibitors. The digest, uh, digestive products in the gut are not uh, uh, completely, uh, the products are not digested and they also interfere with the absorption. Now, this then leads to the growth inhibition of the individuals. Therefore, these are called as enzyme inhibitors and there are certain methods by which we can eliminate this. Lectins or hemagglutinins. Now, as the name suggests, these uh, are also proteins in nature and basically uh, what they do is they again interfere with the digestion of certain products in the gut and also lead to agglutination of red blood corpuscles. Therefore, they are called as hemagglutinins and they are found in about 800 varieties of legumes and pulses. Now, I am just telling you the effect of each antinutritional factor. Saponins are glycosides in nature and when they are eaten in a particular grain, they uh, have a bitter taste and they form foams with the uh, uh, solution with which they are mixed even in water they give a soapy effect and basically they cause hemolysis of RBCs. Uh, after saponins is uh, basically what we call the favism factors which include vicin and covicin and uh, this vicin and covicin mostly uh, cause a disorder called as favism in individuals who are genetically susceptible to this disease. So, when they consume uh, uh, beans such as broad beans or faba beans in large quantities, they it results in a hemolytic disease and this is called as favism. The presence of what we call uh, a disorder called as latherism or it is a syndrome which occurs or which is mostly seen in India due to the consumption of the pulses latheris sativus and mostly it is seen uh, th this pulse grows as uh, wild pulse in the regions of uh, the drought prone areas of Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra etc and it contains a uh, component which is a neurotoxin and which affects only the males and also the central nervous system of uh, uh, males which results in the paralysis of the lower limbs. Phytates are found in pulses basically because of the uh, high levels of phosphorus which uh, converts itself into phytate phosphorus which interfere with the bioavailability and the digestion of the various minerals as well as proteins and carbohydrates. Now, we also have certain components called as goitrogens. Now, these goitrogens are substances which uh, prevent the thyroid gland from taking up iodine uh, and causes a deficiency of iodine in the thyroid gland and these are called as goitrogens and these are mostly found in uh, groundnuts as well as soya beans etc. The cyanogenic compounds or cyanogenic glycosides, uh, these are glycosides in nature and these are found mostly in all the pulses to some extent or the other. Now, these cyanogenic glycosides when they are uh, hydrolyzed, they release HCN or hydrogen cyanide or hydrocyanogenic gases. Oligosaccharides of the raffinose family are very very commonly found in various pulses and this leads to the production of gases when one consumes the pulses. Now, this is due to the presence of the three uh, basic sugars that is raffinose, stachyose and verbiscose which do not get digested due to the absence of the enzyme alpha galactosidase in the stomach. So, these uh, sugars in fact once they reach the uh, 
lower part of the intestinal tract, they are acted upon by the microflora present over there which results in the release of plenty of gases like a combination of carbon dioxide, hydrogen and methane. Therefore, they release a lot of gas and which causes a lot of discomfort. Now, the common uh, reaction to the allergens is nausea and vomiting. Now, coming to how do we eliminate all these anti-nutritional factors. Now, some of these factors are what we call heat labile or some which can be destroyed when they are subjected to a heat treatment. Therefore, uh, I start by the basic method where there are some or most of these are water soluble also. So, when all of us what we do before we cook is we soak these pulses. So, when we soak these pulses uh, in a way it is good because we are getting rid of most of these anti uh, nutritional factors which are water soluble. So, soaking and throwing away the water in which we soak and using fresh water for cooking ensures that you are getting rid of part of the anti nutritional factors. Then comes the cooking process. So, you know very well that because of their compact molecules and difficult to cook properties, they need to be pulses and legumes need to be cooked for long periods of time. So, therefore, when you are applying heat for long periods to cook them and also when you autoclave them, you are destroying the components which are heat sensitive such as the first one enzyme inhibitors and hemagglutinins and other components which get destroyed because of the heat properties or application of heat.